this is Palm Sunday. Uh, everybody know that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. All right. That's, okay. Uh, where's the palms? Where's Sunday? <laughs> so um, I'm going to do something I've never done in all the years of my being a pastor. I am not going to preach on the Palm Sunday passage. <laughs> Talk about radical. <laughs> It'll still have Jesus in it, though. So, okay. <laughs> so, um, I've been uh, I've been really interested in these uh, encounters that Jesus is having with people. We've been looking at going up towards Easter, and uh, today I want us to look at one that will actually tie in with the crowd a little bit. Okay, so you kind of get that flavor of Palm Sunday, but it really is one of the most um, uh, fascinating encounters that Jesus has with, with a person. And uh, I, I want us to look at uh, Matthew chapter 16. Okay. And uh, beginning in verse 13. Uh, Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi and he asked his disciples who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you? Isn't that a good question? What about you? Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon, son, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by people, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, the rock, and on this rock I'll build my church in the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples, verse 21, uh, that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never this will never happen to you. And Jesus turned to him and, and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. So Lord, teach us from this very strange encounter. Teach us uh, how we might uh, respond to you and how we might hear your call in our life and how we might uh, grow and serve and follow you. Amen. Um. Okay, I got to talk about that because, you know, if anybody has, has spent much time in a psychiatric hospital, as I have, you know, uh, I work there, okay? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Can't tell the patients from the help, you know? But um, there are always these tests, you know, that uh, kind of show your personality. And I thought, what a test this would be for Peter. One minute, he's got it right. And he's being lifted up in front of the others and held up and, and, and told you, I'm going to build the church on you and, and your confession of faith is from God himself and, and the gates of hell will not prevail. And just this huge thing. And then a couple of verses later, he's Satan. Wow. Talk about a bipolar experience. <laughs> My gosh. He didn't want to share that when he got to church. Uh, what happened there? Well, I think it starts uh, th this place that Jesus went way up in the north end of uh, uh, the country, uh, right, almost a border town of Caesarea Philippi. And it was a really fascinating place because it was like Seattle. Uh, it, there was water everywhere. It was the headwaters of the uh, Jordan River started there out of a cave. And uh, and that was where they found, archaeologists had found uh, 17 temples to the Syrian uh, fertility god Baal. 17, that's like Christian Reformed churches up in Linden. I mean, they're like everywhere. <laughs> and, uh, and so they had that, but also it was the, uh, the epicenter of worship of the Greek god Pan. Uh, I've heard the pipes of Pan, you know, those things. Uh, Pan uh, was the uh, the god of the nature and you know gods in the water, gods in the trees, gods in the sky. Very Seattleish, you know, really. Um, and uh, if that's where we get the word uh, a pantheist, so many gods, all the gods, 
I worship everything. Um, pandemonium comes from that. John Milton, writing in that great book in Paradise Lost, the capital of hell is he named Pandemonium. That's where the word came from. And, and it means total chaos and, and out of control. And, uh, and that's where Jesus was with the disciples. And, the, and in this weird center, um, he asked them, what, are, what do people say that I am? Who, who do they say that I am? He had a place where people believe all kinds of stuff. Some things that are a little reasonable and some that are just crazy, you know. And uh, who do they say I am? It's interesting because they could have said, well, some say you're a drunk and some say you hang out with hookers and some say, you know, you're a lawbreaker. Or, uh, but they said, well, some think you're the reincarnation of, of John the Baptist. Uh, others think uh, that you're uh, Elijah. Come back, and some of you think think it's uh, Jeremiah, one of the other prophets. Now it's interesting because John the Baptist was like the the new hot preacher in town until he got his head cut off. Um, that slowed things down, but um, <laughs> but uh, so they thought, well, this must be the reincarnation because John was a fire and brimstone, passionate. You know, it's really brought it, and uh, and he'd now come back to life as uh, in when Jesus came back as John the Baptist. Basically, it's kind of like Snoop Dogg saying that he's the reincarnation. Of Bob Marley uh, and changed his name to Snoop Lion. You know, it's kind of like, I'm not saying it's the same, you know, but <laughs> anyway, that, that's what some people were thinking. Others thought uh, Elijah, because Elijah was the prophet associated with power and miracles. And so, well, so we've got the strong, passionate, fire and brimstone preacher or the miracles and the power. And then Jeremiah was the one who found uh, hope in suffering. So all of those things were people were noticing and linking in with Jesus. As far as we know, Jesus never commented about any of that. He then said, what about you? What about you? Which I think may be one of the great questions of all times. What about you? Who do you say I am? I get, I get letters over the years. I get a lot of letters. And I used to keep all the hate mail and throw away the good letters, you know. And then a friend said, that, you're stupid. Why don't you turn that around? <laughs> throw away the hate mail and keep the good ones. But then I also get just generally odd ones. And this one, I, uh, this one came to me many years ago. Uh, actually, when I was working with Sheila down in uh, California in Walnut Creek, Presbyterian Church there. I got this really nice letter. I just want to thank you for the friendship and the welcome we've received as we visited your church. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Thank you for the cookies we received. <laughs> we used to send cookies at our house, you know. Uh, I baked them. Uh, they were really nice. But we really don't want to be in a church that worships Jesus as Lord. <laughs> <laughs> That got me right there, you know. I wasn't expecting that one, you know. But they liked the cookies. <laughs> and we were friendly. They just didn't like this Jesus thing. Then they went on. There are a lot of wise people who have said religious things. If you could just get off Jesus for a while and get on some other things. And then they had a list from like basically from the Barnes and Noble uh, New Age section, you know, which they listed all these things. Uh, why don't you preach on these for a while? <laughs> when I looked at that, I thought, this is a little bit of what was going on in Caesarea Philippi. Uh, <clears throat> whatever you want, go worship that. It, it was so Seattle. You, you know, we live in a place where anything goes, sometimes anything goes except Jesus. If you could just get off Jesus for a while and get on to some other stuff, that would be, we'd like the cookies even better. You know? uh, what about you? Who do you say that I am? One above, among many wise people who said religious things? 
Or are you the Christ, the son of the living God? God breaking into our world to transform our lives. What do you say? I think that this may be one of our life's ultimate, ultimate questions. And uh, I was trying to think back when I was confronted with this, and uh, it's happened many times actually, I probably had a lot of conversion experiences because I remember that going through in college thinking, I don't need this religious stuff anymore, I don't need church anymore, I'm really fed up with the church I was going to, as most people are, you know, president <laughs> company accepted. <laughs> um, and uh, I think I was having a fight with a pastor or something, and uh, and my parents were bugging me, and, and I remember sitting in, in uh, my apartment that I was sharing with some friends and thinking, I don't need this. I don't need what the church is handing out, <coughs> excuse me. And I don't need what my parents are pushing on me. I don't need uh, Campus Crusade for Christ telling me how to share, not share. I, I, I this whole thing going. And when I got done ranting to myself, it was like Jesus sat there and went, well, what are you going to do with me? And I don't know. What am I going to do? What can I do? What uh, do I throw Jesus out with everything else? And it was at that point that I had to stop and say, you know, you be my Lord. My throat's drying up. You be my Lord. And let's leave everything else out. Forget, forget the family and the parents and all that stuff. Forget the church. Forget the pastor. My goodness. It irritates me. And, and, and forget what my friends are telling me. And forget the peer pressure around me at college. Forget what the professors are telling me to believe or not believe. Forget it all. And just go forward with Jesus. And then immediately I thought, is that going to be enough? Will Jesus be enough? Or do I need all this other stuff? Well, guess what? He's enough. He's totally enough. But it was at that moment, I could have, I had the freedom, I could have walked away. What about you? I think for every one of us, there comes a time where, where Jesus turns to us, like he did to me, and says, what about you? What are you going to do with me? You're going to set me aside? You're going to put me on a shelf with all the other Barnes and Noble books? You're going to set aside whatever? Or are you going to accept me into your life as your Lord, your Savior, and let me be the Lord of your life? What about you? I think if uh, <coughs> when we look back, when we look back and and look at that decision, because I know many of you have come to that point in your life where you've had to decide that. Some just this year. And you have to decide that and you go, oh, thank you. I've got water now. <laughs> You didn't want me choking and dying up here today. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so you've, you've had to decide that. And when I look back on it, I think, okay, so what happened? What happens in life because of that? Well, for one, I start taking some of the things Jesus says more seriously. For example, um, when he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but through me, I think. If he's my Lord and Savior, then I have access, uh, I have a relationship with God. And uh, I belong to him. And uh, that changes things for me. <coughs> it changes the way I look at other people. It changes the way I look at, at death. It changes the way I look at life. 
It, it changes everything about it. And also, I realize that, that we're never alone. When we say, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, that's that's my statement, then, then I take seriously what Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Look, I'm with you always, even to the end. <clears throat> And I've actually, I've experienced that over the years. The sense of feeling of like, am I alone? And, and, you know, what am I going to do? And then I realized realize I'm not alone. Even in the bottom, even in the worst places I've been, I, it's like I look over and there's Jesus sitting there with me. Going, wow, you thought you'd get away with, from me here? You kidding? I'm with you. And, uh, and I found that he was there in the celebrating times and he was there in the dull times and he was just saying, you're not getting away from me. I'm with you always, even to the end. And that makes a difference for me. And, you know, I gotta admit, I I don't do death very well. Um, although it's funny, because I've done the funerals for all my relatives, my parents, my uh, grandparents, <coughs> even the pagan ones. Yeah. They still had me do that, and uh, uncles and aunts and friends, and um, I have never felt comfortable in any funeral or memorial service. I remember sitting with a lady next to the body of her husband who had just died a few hours earlier, and we're just sitting there talking, sharing, hearing stories about the husband, and uh, as if it was the most natural thing in the world. I, I didn't feel comfortable. Maybe you would have. I didn't. And I'm not comfortable thinking about my own death, except I keep coming back to, what about you, John? Who do you say that I am? And if I say you're the uh, you're Christ, or you're the son of the living God, I'm putting my trust in you, you're the Lord of my life. If I'm saying that, then I have to take seriously when he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And I'll come back and I'll bring you with me so that you'll be where I am. And the sting of death, while it stings, it's not crushing you because you belong to me. And if you have eternal life, then your life, eternal life doesn't end and with your physical death, it goes on. And the people that we love, that, that, that we miss so much, We'll be with again. If I take him at his word. I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. Isn't that a great statement? I would have told you if it wasn't that way. I wouldn't have lied to you. Made you believe something that wasn't true? I would have told you if it weren't so. And so I can have hope that it is so. Now, this encounter with Jesus, Peter, after he comes out with this brilliant statement, maybe speaking for all the disciples, and Jesus affirms him so much, Build the church, you're the rock, you're solid. And he's thinking, I am, aren't I? And uh, the gates of hell will not prevail. You can't, they can't keep you back, you know. Not that hell will be attacking you, but the, you know, because gates don't attack people, but um, <laughs> they won't be able to hold you out as you run in there, you know. And uh, and then we turn it right around, and Jesus turns to him and says, Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> What a slump that would be. Jesus calling you Satan. Nah, that's different than if I call you Satan. Uh, that's something. Why? I think, when I think about it, I think it's that, that Peter wanted the kingdom of God. He wanted Jesus' lordship in his life. He wanted the rule of God in his life. He wanted all that, that, that Jesus could bring to him without the pain and the suffering. Wouldn't that be great? It, honestly, I probably want that too. 
sometimes. You know, if I could just get, you know, everything great, and Jesus is blessing me, and blessing you, and we're all having a great time, you know, toasting marshmallows around the campfire, and everything's super, and singing some songs, and and have it with pain and suffering. So Jesus says, okay, well, we're walking into our death here, and it's going to be bad, and it's going to really hurt, and it's painful, and I'm dreading it. And, and Peter goes, oh, no, 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 that's not going to happen, Lord. That won't happen. Don't you worry about that. And I think there is something tempting about wanting to have it easy, wanting to have a pain-free life. It's very tempting. But then... What does Jesus say? Um, if anyone would come after me, they have to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for me will find it. You've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. That's a hard one to know what that, what that means. Except, what if we took it literally? That when we follow Jesus, I always thought, if you accept Christ into your life and your heart and you follow him, everything works out. Everything is perfect. Every, you know, it's orderly and all that stuff. The, the, the civil engineers like that kind of thing. And nobody, nobody gets hurt in the process. My life was always a little murky, you know. And at first I thought it was because I didn't accept Christ into my life the right way. So... For years, I'd keep going forward to the Baptist church I was going to. I'd keep going forward and accept Christ over and over again as my Savior because I couldn't get it right. <laughs> the girls didn't like me. You know, I didn't have any. And uh, I was still a mess. And, uh, and uh, I think some of the old saints in the church thought, you know, it's a missionary son. You know, <laughs> you know how they are. You know, <laughs> they have problems. And uh, But I had problems. That, and I always thought if I could just get rid of the struggle and the problems and the pain and the frustration, I could really follow Jesus. I could really be a disciple. I could be effective in ministry. I could do, maybe someday I'd even be preaching and stuff if I could just get everything fixed behind me so I can just focus on the Lord. I think that's a little bit about what Peter was saying. Everything should be great now, Lord. But I confess you. Jesus goes, you want to follow me? Take up your cross and follow me. Meaning, you're going to follow me with the pain, with the suffering, with the frustrations and the disappointments and the screw-ups and the unfairness of life and all these things. You're going to pick up that and carry it and follow me with it. You're going to trust me with that. Because he knew that if he waited for all of us to get it together before we follow him, it would be a very small group. <laughs> and the ones in that group would probably be lying and hiding. Okay? So. So what about you? What about you? Who do you say Jesus is? Not just who do you believe Jesus is. That's different. Who do you say he is? What do you tell somebody? What do you say he's done in your life? Or what do you say that you need him to do in your life? What do you say about what you hope he will do in you and through you? What about you? And what about you? What are you going to pick up and carry when you follow him? What is it that you carry now? What burden do you have? What heartbreak? What, uh, what pain or struggle that you just can't seem to get victory over? What, what secret that you hope the phone doesn't ring and expose you? What, what is it that you have that that you're going to need to pick up and carry when you follow Jesus. He invites you to come along with that stuff. What about you? This Easter week, 
We're moving towards the resurrection. We're moving towards victory over death. We're moving towards eternal life. But we're going through the passion. We're going through it hard times getting there this week. I'd love for you to take this week to say, what about me? Put that on top of the paper. What about me? <clears throat> Who do you say Jesus is? Where do you need him to meet you this week in your life? And what burden do you carry that you need to say, Lord, thank you for calling me to follow you even with this baggage? This is a screwy letter. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the cookies. They were really nice. But we really don't want to be in a church that worships Jesus as Lord. At least they were honest, right? At least, and I thought, I was proud of our church, that they came and they visited and they realized we worship Jesus as Lord. Okay, they got it. <laughs> they got the message. <laughs> Deeply disappointed. Sorry, we let them down. But Jesus will not let you down. So worship him as Lord. Today, tomorrow, and every day. Lord, come into our hearts. Come into our lives. Come into our relationships and our finances and our work and our home. Come into every part of our life and have your way. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. And we would follow you even with our crosses that we bear. Lead us through this week and surprise us along the way with joy. We'll give you thanks. Amen. Amen.